Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us for this very special event tonight, Common Ground Sanctuary, curated and led by the wonderful Solidarity for Sanctuary. My name is William Warriner. I go by he, him. I'm the lead producer of USC Arts in Action, and we are a part of Visions and Voices, the Arts and Humanities Initiative. And as ever, I wish I could see your faces while I was saying this, but we're really grateful to seeing so many of you show up to create online community. Um, and if you'd like to let us know where you're calling in from or, or zooming in from in the chat, it's always nice to see. I can see people from all over the moment, so that's great. Um, Arts and Action's mission is to plant seeds for positive social change by creating collaborative arts projects that address major social issues, including racial justice, homelessness, incarceration reform, environmental justice, and many forms of systemic oppression. And on this theme of challenging oppression, we also believe it's important to open all of our events by acknowledging the indigenous land that we share. Arts in Action and Visions and Voices acknowledge that the University of Southern California was built on the ancestral and unceded lands of the Tongva, Chumash and Keech nations. We honor them and all indigenous people, past, present and future, and we pay respect to their continued survival and contributions to our society. We share these acknowledgements to raise awareness about histories that are too often erased or forgotten, to pay respect to the original caretakers of this land and to recognize our place in this history. Thank you. And recognition of these facts is one of the reasons that we created the Common Ground series, featuring the intersecting themes of land, water and sanctuary. Common Ground has been specifically curated by community partners whose work addresses immigration, environmental justice, displacement and collective ownership, to name a few things. And tonight we have an amazing expansive programme featuring music and spoken word performances, film, visual arts and a live panel conversation, all lovingly shaped by Solidarity for Sanctuary's founder, Doris Munoz. A child of undocumented immigrants from Mexico, Doris began her career in the music industry and seeing a lack of representation and regard for immigrants and BIPOC communities, she was inspired to found Miha Management and Solidarity for Sanctuary to impact and empower the Latinx community through education and organizing. And these organizations act as a space to launch first generations artist careers and build the bridge between art and activism across the country by concerts that raise awareness and funds for immigrant focused nonprofits. Doris's goal is to continue the momentum of the current movement by amplifying the message of the marginalized through leveraging creative partnerships and platforms for social change. Last but not least, she's also a current civic media fellow within the USC Annenberg Innovation Lab, and this event would not be happening without her, so thank you so much. In half an hour's time, Doris will be introducing tonight's panel conversation between USC Thornton faculty Hasmi Morales and the creators of Netflix's Hentified, Marvin Lemus, Linda Yvette Chavez, and showrunner Stephanie Asuna Hernandez. First, though, uh, let's hear from Doris as she introduces the first half of tonight's program filmed at Hollywood's Jeffrey Deitch Gallery. Over to you, Doris. Hola, hola, saludos, bienvenidos. My name is Doris Munoz and I'm the founder of Solidarity for Sanctuary. And welcome to tonight's program, the closing event of Common Ground, exploring the theme of sanctuary, presented by Arts in Action, a part of USC's Visions and Voices. We are very grateful to be presenting tonight. We are live from the Jeffrey Deitch Gallery, where we're going to be walking through the Shattered Glass exhibition curated by AJ Gerard and Milan Frierson. Then you will see a beautiful poetry performance by Bay Davis and a musical performance by Sancha in front of Rafa Esparza's painting with Rafa in the flesh and a surprise guest. So tune in as we explore the theme of sanctuary in the realms of how we can create safe spaces for queer, black and brown art to thrive to then create change and hold space for our community. So we're here to uplift the Trans Latina Coalition tonight and all the beautiful work that they are doing. So let's dive in. Hey guys, welcome. Uh, my name is AJ Gerard, alongside Moana Farson. And we are here to welcome you to our first project, Shattered Glass, here at the Jeffrey Deitch Gallery in Los Angeles. Um, we're super excited to share this program with you. This show encompasses about 40 artists of color, um, a lot of first time in the space artists, a lot of Los Angeles energy. Shattered Glass, if it does nothing else, is here to promote change, um, bring in community, and promote diversity in the art world. 
our first artwork tonight um, done by Gabriela Ruiz. This is an amazing example of color and taking up full space, which is again a big part of the conversation. Um, I think fun parts of the work for me and Milan were just about how Gabby, um, her true love of culture and performative nature and just like really, really coming strong. We couldn't deny her. This piece is one of our favorites. It's where the show starts for both uh, me and Milan. And I think it's just due to the idea of in normal response, I think we're often expected to uh, shrink, to feel small. You're obviously picking up this sort of notion of being put in a place of being micromanaged on two surveillance cameras, both here and here. I think, um, in short, you're kind of looking at a spin laundry mat cycle um, that sort of becomes this like whimsical feel of color, of energy, of culture. There's zolte that pulls in, there's foam that expands out. Um, all these ideas are really, really amazing. Yeah, basically what you're seeing here is Gabby too. All the colors, um, all the vibrancy, and you know, this whole thing started one day when Gabby was at the laundromat and like looked up and saw this camera like angled at her. She's, you know, folding her underwear and it's like we're constantly being surveilled, especially in our communities. Um, you know, our most kind of intimate acts are always being, always being watched. So I love that Gabby, um, you know, flipped the script and, and turned the camera on the viewers. And um, I think it's been great to watch people interact with this, this piece too. Ayala's works really do offer this super clear, precise entry point to like what is inner city LA, which is so special to have that at the Jeffrey Dutch Gallery for Shattered Glass. I mean, there's so many different lexicons and sort of motifs that enter his work. Um, everything is grounded in community. Mario Ayala's works encompass um, friends, families, partners, even his own pets. Both of Mario's pieces are very like LA to me, and I feel like people from LA come in and they recognize um, everything. You've got like the Hollywood sign, the helicopters, Marilyn Monroe, and Tupac, which if you're in Venice, they're like literally together on every cheek. So I love her with her tattoo, smoking a joint, um, the low riders, everything. It's just a fun piece, and we also love the way that Mario dates the work um, on the license plate here. So. I'll finish by saying I think my favorite moment there is sort of in this reflective mirror where you're going to get a sensation of what essentially can happen if you don't have your tags up to date as a person of color. And I love how the works look very fun and festive. And you can be distracted by the Selenas and the Tupacs and the Spongebob and miss out on the really, really political, almost even like don't shoot moments that are super encompassing in the work. I love these three sculptures by um Marjoni, it really is about celebrating community um, and black beauty, honestly. I think a lot of times when people see, you know, images of people with grills or circulating, it's always this kind of negative connotation, um, or they're like thugs or criminals, but it's like, no, actually, like, getting grills is really just, like, a way of, like, adorning yourself, like, that's taking pride in yourself, and that's why he's showing it off, like, it is beautiful, so I love Marjoni just, like, flipping the script and amplifying it and the fact that, you know, she braids in uh, hair with the, the sculptures is just like incredible. And like these are like, you know, these are people you know, these are your friends. So when you see this and people see these sculptures, they like, they freak out, which is great to see people just like connecting with the art and seeing yeah. themselves reflected. When me and Milan first saw these works, we actually, I think, if I can speak for myself, we're a little bit more attracted to just the physicality of the works. I don't think we knew them by name. But just to introduce you to the figures, this is Pink Safu, Zuri, and Charlie, and they all have their own identities. And I think that that's so important with the works is that I think Rajani's really speaking to an African American perspective versus sort of this like universal, it's a very specific experience. And I think that's what we love. Anyone who has that insight will feel super welcome coming into the space. This is a new work by Kizaya Harrell. Uh, it's a fan favorite with everybody, honestly, that comes into the gallery. I think the why it's in the show is probably the most important thing to think through as you're viewing the work. It really is different for us. I think it's important to call out the sort of full figure nude that she's representing. Um, the detailing in the work is super beautiful. She uses glitter, but the effects of it is all done by painting. Um, we originally kind of came across her work on a social media platform, which I think is a great call out to the time and building community. A lot of the artists in Shattered Glass 
had their own followings, their own demographics that they reached out to, and the fact that we were able to pull in those communities and have that representation be like the forefront conversation, I think is the most important just looking at the work. Um, she's sugary garbage on Instagram. Me and Milan both love her posts. It can go from like frogs, uh, <laughs> memes, the painting that she does. She's just, she's just really special, and we yeah. wanted to make space for her. There's a lot of humor, there's a lot of joy, and I think uh, Kizaya, her personality, herself, and her work is ref uh, refreshing for a lot of people because you just, I think a lot of people shrink themselves down and hide who they are, and she's the exact opposite of exactly. that. Yeah. Um, and literally, like, one of the most inspiring people I've ever come across, and just, like, puts joy into everything, which I love. This is a painting by um, Dominican artist Radis Vasquez. And it's actually um, based off of a family photograph of his. So if you see the little boy in the corner there, that's actually Riley's, which is amazing. Um, and this is one I feel like people come in and you can kind of, I don't know, it's something you instantly recognize, like family and the family portrait, but you can like feel, I think, the heat coming from this photo. You can like smell the food on the table. Um, I had a friend come in and ask him which one was his favorite work, and he was like immediately drawn to this one. He's like, it feels so familiar, and he's Dominican. And then when I told him, like, the artist was also Dominican, he was like jumping up and down. But I think to see, yeah, have all these aspects like included in the work and for that to be recognizable too is, is really great. That's ultimately what we wanted. We wanted to build community across the diaspora conversation, so we're really happy to have this work involved in the show. We were super excited to have Devin's work join our conversation of Shattered Glass. In short, it deals with a lot of ideas of memory, loss, um, gentrification, change, re-envisioning spaces and places that we know. This is the artist in the work. He is sort of tugging and pulling at a car that has uh, his father in the, in the window, almost like spiritually coaching him through that scene. You know, um, Devin lost his father as a young boy, so it's really interesting to see him pulling with that memory. And in detail, you'll actually see a boot is on that car, so it sort of shows up as a moment with a history with nowhere to go, almost like grieving, right? And we love this work. It includes places that we know and love, like the Slauson Swap Me. It quickly comments on change, gentrification, typography. It's just very exciting for this show. We're super happy to have a work of Jaime Munoz in the show. He's joined the gallery and other iterations of um, artists of color coming together last seen at Punch, but this is a brand new work for the show. Um, we were in love with the vivid color story. I think Jaime's thinking through sort of this colonization of spirituality, which I think is so rich. So just a quick rundown. The inside of the work on the left, actually the sort of payette scene, Jesus and the Virgin Mary can then become the outside scene on the work on the right, and then reverse with the sort of the indigenous moment there. Um, we love how Jaime's works really, I think draw parallels between like culture, religion, spirituality, almost questioning the existence of like what is Mother Earth in comparison to like sort of the masculine energy of um, Jesus Christ. He shows to help, you know, helps us think about like time through the sort of tales of the folk, you know, the rabbit jumping, the hare jumping across the bottom of the work. In general, it's just a really great invitation to bring in people's culture. Okay, so this sculpture is by uh, Diana D. Alvarado, and it's one of my favorites. Dee's amazing. She's someone uh, whose work I discovered um, from Instagram and just completely instantly fell in love. Um, Dee grew up in East and South LA and you see a lot of that influence in her work. Um, she finds a lot of inspiration in just like the colors, smells, like signs, everything um, in her neighborhood from where she grew up. And this one in particular just like reminds me of like those like sweetheart high school photos and like brings such like a sense of warmth and also makes makes me think of um, Guadalupe Rosales and uh, Veteranas and Rucas and it's just like all that stuff comes to life, all these like, I don't know, evocations of like memory and like this beautiful, just like sweet time that exists and even, yeah, the way that Dee does like, you know, the, the stands, everything is like there's so much detail and I just, I love it. Alfonso Gonzalez's piece definitely centers culture, tradition, family, masculinity, familiarity, all into one beautiful portrait for us. Um, this work, I think, definitely defies the eyes and really does the work of what Shattered Glass intended to do, which was make our stories larger than life. Um, we like this work in particular because everything about it, you meet 
the horse at eye contact level, then you have to then look up at the figure. It offers a really beautiful sort of landscape behind us that's familiar to LA. Everything what Alfonso does down to the debris on the ground is so true to the culture, so true to LA. I like that this is sort of like the middle generation of both images on both sides of this wall that really does show a different side of like, I think the brown masculine presentation in art and we're really, really excited to have this sort of be the center of Shattered Class. So we're gonna conclude our personal walkthrough with the show. Um, this piece, I think, definitely lands a lot of concepts um, and we're lucky to actually have the artist with us tonight. So um, we're just gonna ask Rafa why and what kind of, what, what are we looking at tonight? Um, so we're looking at, uh, it's a landscape painting of um, one of my favorite bars in Los Angeles called Temple. And it's one of the first like queer Latinx bars that I came that I came to when I actually wasn't even out of the closet yet. Um, and the car was maybe 19 or 20. Um, but it's painted on a adobe surface. Uh, material, it's a building material that's very common in uh, like dry uh, desert areas around the globe. It's a material that I inherited um, to learn how to work with from my father, Ramon Esparza who was a brick maker in Durango, Mexico before it came up to the States. Um, the material itself is incredibly loaded. Um, I think of it as a process that's brought me closer to, um, to build a relationship to my city. Um, not the city that's built up, but everything that's underneath it. Um, but so I've been it's also been a way for me to kind of like come back to this practice of pain because I hadn't been painting for over a decade. Um, so using land as a surface that I could address through the making of images on top of it, um, where I could unearth histories, um, bring some visibility towards narratives that are often lost, um, and literally use a material that I think comes into conflict with white cube architecture such as this one. And the images that I ended up um, kind of like building this collage with was an Im one of the images is made by uh, Sean Mong um, and it captured really beautifully um, just like the atmosphere but the reality or my memory of, of this club um, that like many queer spaces I feel is very precarious in terms of like how we build these spaces in the face of like so much adversity in the face of so much hate. Um, but this bar in particular has um, a room in it. That's um, where they play live Norteño music, uh, regional music that's very popular in northern parts of Mexico, um, where in the culture you don't like a cowboy hat, boots, um, basically how these men are fashioned. Um, and it's like, a, it feels very special to me because it's like a, it's a space um, where people that are coming from like these very uh, homophobic, misogynist, incredibly like macho uh, spaces um, can still embody like that aspect of their culture and also be like fully who they are. Um, and so I haven't like I've been to many places in Mexico. I've been to many many like cities where brown people from communities exist, and I haven't found like the same like energy, the same life in any of these clubs. Um, and so I wanted to kind of mirror this, mirror these precarities, right? The precarity of this space. If you know, not knowing at the time if this space would survive the pandemic, um, and how precarious this material is, it literally kind of falls apart and changes. Um, when it's being transported, when it's being installed. Um, and so I, you know, like the moments that are very special about this work are like the crack that happened just next to the two hands that are kind of like holding each other. I think there's something just really perfect that we can wrap up just about how like all the pieces are on the ground and that's sort of a shattered moment that doesn't have to be perfect. We really wanted this show to be an invitation to build. So we're excited that this brings it back to earth and brings it back to nature and honesty and realness and stuff. Yeah, um, thank you guys for joining us tonight on this walkthrough. <laughs>
Esta es para Rafa. Thank you for your beautiful work. Estos eran dos amigos que venían de Mapimí. Que por no venir se dio quis robaron Juana se vi. Aquí 
con nuestros amigos de Trébol Dorado. Y I'm Sancha. Ya se fueron las flores y llegó el invierno y tú ni me
I live in a little house in the middle of South Central. Hate public transportation and can't never go nowhere without some lashes on. I keep buying plants, even though I can't take care of them, eat rice. With damn near every meal, have a volcanic temper, cause who gon' stop me? I write poems for bearded girls and bamboo earrings that know grief by his first name. Fuck walking, bitch, I strut on eggshells. I may not have a womb, but baby, I birth a revolution. I may not have a womb, but please believe that I am more than capable of birthing a revolution. I am all white, head wrapped, pretty and protected. I am almost always one of the most powerful bitches in the room. I'm all dollar Kool-Aid and the fish fry and beauty supply is right next door. I'm all finesse and in my bag, as quiet as it's kept because a bitch is still poor. I am generations of lessons learned, the confusing and conscious. My existence is exhausting. I am not a martyr or your mother. I am not, yes, honey, queen, slater, boots down house. I am not a character off pose. I am a full ass person, unscripted. Keep lavender where I lay my head and a 45 in my purse at all times. I'm a woman not to be fucked with, cat called, or celebrated and paraded for convenience. I love, I love, and I love, and I love like my life depends on it. And I've learned to do so for myself. Every day, I don't take my face off before bed. The last thing that I am is brave. The last thing that I am is brave for choosing, for choosing to be who I am, who I've always been. I was born, live, and will probably die because I'm trans and I am strong. <laughs> I am strong for deciding to be alive. I'm strong for choosing my survival. There's a man outside. There's a man outside that does not know my name and will fix his mouth to call me everything in the book, but I've been Mr. and Ma'am in the same breath so often. Sometimes it's hard to tell what stick from stone and I've never met a woman alive that doesn't know what it is to be loved and hated by a man in the same sentence. And isn't it, isn't it always the ones that love us? Isn't it always the ones that love us the most? I once watched an ex-boyfriend of mine spit on my grave and still welcomed him home, picked his teeth with what's left of my bone. I'm walking down the street with butterflies in my stomach for, for all the wrong reasons. And I know tonight I am the closest to God that I have ever been. There's a man outside. There's a man outside that does not know my name and will fix his mouth to call me everything in the book, but in my God, I have never met a woman alive that does not know what it is to be loved and hated by a man in the same sentence. Hello, beautiful people. My name is Bambi Salcedo, and I do have the privilege to be the president and the CEO of the Trans Latino Coalition. And my name is Mache, and I have the privilege and honor to be the manager of policy and community engagement for the Trans Latino Coalition. The organization does so much different work to address the needs of trans, gender nonconforming, intersex people here in Los Angeles, but across the country and across the world, to be honest, from direct services to policy advocacy to campaigns that free our people from state violence. The organization does so much to really move forward um, our, our community and trans people in general. And the work that we do, it really is to transform our society. It really is to change the structures that continue to marginalize us, but also to empower our community in a way that we together are going to um, create the changes that need to happen in our community. Mm -hmm. And so currently we are here at the Center for Violence Prevention and Transgender Wellness where we do all of the amazing work um, that happens here for our community, by our community. And so we're so excited to welcome you into our space and to give you an inside look at how the work happens here at the organization. The work that we do uh, is through partnerships and collaborations and we value our partnerships and we value our comrades and so we want to invite you to be part of the movement, to be part of the creation that not just the Trans Latino Coalition is doing but also along with our comrades and our partners. Um, so please get with it and get with us. From the conception of the organization, the organization was really meant to address the specific needs of trans-Latino immigrants that reside in the United States. For folks that were coming from 
a multiplicity of different countries across the world, uh, fleeing violence, seeking better opportunity, really looking for community here in the US. And around the time that the organization started, there were no organizations like Trans Latino Coalition. And even today, there aren't many organizations that are specifically working with tr trans Latinx immigrant folks. And so the fact that the organization <clears throat> is led by these people for these people and this space is a space of safety and of comfort and really a home for a lot of our community um, is just so beautiful. I am very lucky um, that we collectively have built a safe space, a sanctuary for our community, um, which is also built on solidarity, right? Um, because the work that we do is not only transforming the way society is seeing us, but it's also um, contributing to changing the landscape of our community. And we believe that having a safe space to where people can come to um, and really be, being away from the violence that we experience every day, it's, it's one way to the solution. But in addition to that, providing our people with the very much needed services that um, many organizations and really society as a whole has denied for us. So the fact that we're creating a sanctuary for our community based on solidarity is one of the things that sets us apart from a traditional nonprofit organization. You know, what is the end goal of our liberation? And it's to ultimately tear down these systems and build anew or, you know, give power to our people to be able to create a world that really values us. And so for organizations like Trans Latina being built, we are creating that power and we are creating that, that sustainability and we are creating that space for our people long term. We are doing several different statewide campaigns around policy change here in California, and there's specifically one that some folks may have heard of. Um, in 2020, we were able to pass a bill called Assembly Bill 2218, which is the Transgender Wellness and Equity Fund, um, which is amazing. It was passed by entirely a trans-led organizations and a coalition of trans-led organizations across California. And so that bill passed last year to create a fund within the Department of Public Health to fund healthcare services for trans people across the state. And, you know, because of COVID, this fund passed, but they didn't put any money into the fund. And so this year we've been doing a lot of work to ensure that the state really invests in our community and gets the money and the resources to the community that we deserve. And so, you know, if you follow us on social media, if you at all keep up with our work, you'll find different ways to support, but there's so many different ways that you can support the organization from advocacy, from donations, from direct support, and so we look forward to seeing you soon. Yes, thank you. Hello, hello. Thank you so much, everyone who's been tuning in. Uh, today means the world for you all to see the work that we've been able to put together to just bring all our worlds colliding into one space. Uh, I wanted to introduce the amazing Hasmin Morales, who will be moderating today's conversation. Uh, Hasmin is a dear friend, <laughs> uh, feels like extended family at this point, and she's also an amazing adjunct professor right now at USC in the Thornton School. Uh, she's an amazing violinist, activist, administrator uh, at Colburn, shaking the world up there for, for brown kids who want to get into the performing arts world. She's the founder Fortissima, honestly, a huge role model to myself and I think a lot of us women who are in the arts space. Uh, she is a classically trained violinist who also grew up playing mariachi and other regional Mexican music. Her family's amazing. <laughs> Morales, she navigates um, the the space between uh, fine arts and classical work and folk art traditions and acting as a cultural translator between these worlds. And right now she currently serves as assistant director of the Colburn School Center for Innovation and Community Impact, uh, where she founded an artistic and leadership development program for young women of color in classical music. So all that to say, es una chingona. <laughs> and I'm very grateful that we get to share this space with her tonight and leading this conversation with the amazing creators of Netflix. Hentified. So, Hasmin, my girl, take it away. Thank you so much, Loris. It's an honor to be invited into this amazing space that you've created for us, uh, truly a sanctuary. 
um, for us all. And it's my honor to introduce our esteemed panel, uh, beginning with uh, the iconic Linda Yvette Travis, who is a co-creator, co-showrunner, and executive producer of Netflix's hit series, Kentify. And she also adapted I Am Not Your Perfect Mexican Daughter, a New York Times bestseller by Erica Sanchez into a feature film. Uh, Linda is a graduate of the WGA's prestigious showrunner training program and Sundance Momentum Fellow and was named a writer creator to watch by Robert Rodriguez, Lin Manuel Miranda, and Zoe Saldana as part of their Latinx list in 2019 and 2020. Glamour Magazine named Linda one of the top Latinas, changing the game for representation in television, because she is. Currently, Linda is writing a film for Searchlight, showrunning season two of Kentified, and preparing to direct her first feature film. Damn girl, how you sleep? That's a lot. <laughs> I'm a little tired, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for having me, I'm excited to be here. Okay. Um, next we have Marvin Lemus, who is an award-winning screenwriter, director, and producer with a passion for telling unapologetic stories and in an eclectic body of work ranging from the film festival circuit to the digital world. Most recently, Marvin co-created and directed Hentified, a bilingual digital series, executive produced by America Ferreira and Macro. Lemus has worked with rising comedy stars, including Teresa Thompson, Olivia Munn, and Lil Ray Howery, and directed a successful viral video for brands such as Vogue, Anheuser-Busch, Nissan, MLB, and Time. Uh, his wildly successful digital campaign for the feature film, Dear White People, received over 8 million views. Rad, welcome, Marvin. Thank you for joining us. Hello, hello, sorry. And uh, uh, I, I just realized I'm like, I really need to update my bio. It's a little old. <laughs> But all those things are still true and still cool, so I'll, I'm happy. Excellent. And last but not least, we have the amazing Stephanie Osuna Hernandez, who is a writer director from Inglewood, California, represent. She started in digital as a video producer for We Are Me Too and has directed content for various Latinx small businesses. She was the assistant to Marvin Lemus and Linda Yvette Chavez for season one of Gentified and returned as their showrunner's assistant for season two. She's currently working at Netflix's Con Todo, creating content for their original titles and is directing a, a directing fellow for a film independence project in involved 2021. Yay. She recently directed the short Dreamer, which is currently on the film festival circuit and was selected for the official Latino Film Festival. Congrats and welcome, Stephanie. Hello. Uh, well, as I said, this is just such an honor to convene this space, this, this conversation, the sanctuary with such esteemed guests and colleagues. And on behalf of USC, I just want to thank each and every one of you for making the time to be here and share your wisdom um, and your experience with our students and our audiences. Um, and I'm especially excited to be hosting this conversation in particular, just moments, minutes actually, uh, after concluding my final class of the semester. Um, most of my students have actually logged on here, so shout out to my uh, Art Sports 504 class, um, where Hentified was actually required viewing. It was on the syllabus for my class this year, so it's just a serendipitous and perfect little bow to wrap this semester. Um, as Doris mentioned earlier in the program, the theme of tonight's uh, events and conversation is exploring the concept of sanctuary as both a place of refuge and a condition upon which creativity depends. So the questions posed here will invite us to view sanctuary through different lenses that will give us insight into our panelists' backgrounds, work, philosophy. Um, and I'd also like to take this, this moment to point out the Q&A feature for our audience. Um, if you'd like to submit questions for the panel, uh, please go through the Q&A as the chat will get uh, pretty lit. And so your questions might get lost. Put them through the Q&A feature and we'll get to those um, at the end of the conversation. Um, and so with that, I'd love to jump right in. Um, you know, as, as a SoCal, Chicana, Mariachera, nerd, growing up between LA and Bakersfield, Hentified was itself a sanctuary for me to feel deeply seen um, and to see my people represented in such a beautiful and authentic way. So thank you for that, for creating this for us. Um, and, uh, and I know that for folks who don't belong to this community, it was a different kind of sanctuary for them. It was a place for them to, uh, an entry point into our community, into the beauty of our lives and our struggle of lives of Latin folks, of artists, queer folks. Um, and so in considering sanctuary through this lens of access and entry points, I'd love to pose a question to all of our panelists. Um, what was your point of entry into the world of entertainment? Um, and essentially, how did you get your start? And what were the conditions that allowed you to flourish in this world that was really not set up for people like us? Let's see, Linda, you wanna kick us off? Oh, damn, yes. I was like looking at Marvin like you. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, 
for me, um, I think my journey is in entertainment started actually in undergrad. You know, we're talking about USA. I went to Stanford for undergrad. I went to SC for, for grad school. But it was in undergrad that, apologies, there's a lot of traffic going on outside. It was in undergrad um, that I first read work um, by people of color, by BIPOC folks. I The first thing I read that like, um, I saw myself in and saw my community in was a play by Sheree Murata called Giving Up the Ghost. I had done my first year at Stanford and felt very, uh, the culture shock of being in a predominantly white environment. You know, I showed up with my parents at like six in the morning because my dad's a ranchero. So we were there at the crack of dawn and seeing all the workers coming in and I was like, all oh, these workers look like me and my family. And then when I got to check in and go up the elevator, all the people who were going there did not. And I remember that first year just feeling so out of place. And the beginning of the next year, I took this course with um, one of the only black professors at the school, Harry Elam, who had this course called Social Portraits Theater. And when I read his work, uh, the works that he had us read, like the August Wilsons, the Sri Maragas, people that I, I had never heard of, my whole world changed. And it wasn't at that point that I decided that I wanted to tell stories about my community because I didn't know that I could. Um, and that eventually led me to USC to go do to film, do film and TV. And I always knew that I wanted to tell the stories of the people that I love and have been witnessing their beauty since I was like a kid. And I wanted to show that in any way that I could. And TV and film, like you, uh, Jasmine, I'm a huge nerd. So I grew up obsessed with TV and film and watching like all the, all the things and wanting to do film and TV, but not really knowing that it was a thing. So when I applied to USC, I was like, I, I didn't really expect to get in. I didn't expect it to be a thing and then I did and my whole world changed. And then from there, you know, went from there. I won't get into the challenges of it all because I think that's a whole other conversation. I'll let, let Steph and, and Marvin talk about their, their entry points into this. Yeah, um, yeah, for myself, um, you know, I mean, you, specifically you're talking about where did I find like sanctuary? Where did it all start for me? And I think I I've, I've was a bookworm from a young age, was obsessed with reading. I mean, it's also how I was learning English. I was an ESL kid, and um, and uh, but at an early age, discovered the camera and, and uh, fell in love with it, and fell in love with like you know realized that somebody had to make all the stuff on the TV, and um, but when I think about you know this this question specifically, maybe really think about lately, I've been thinking a lot about my mother and how she it's really, really where it started when it, when you think about fostering this uh, creativity, my mom was always supportive and was always uh, somebody that, you know, she saw this interest and this hobby and this thing and this creativity that I wanted to, to pursue and kept pushing it and kept making me aware and believe and wholeheartedly that it was possible and that I could do it if I, if I busted my ass. And, um, and she did it, you know, by, by example as well, because my mom worked in radio my whole life. She was a DJ. And so I grew up in radio stations and being able to see her produce her show um, and, and seeing that her, for her being at work, wasn't just like, you know, making her show and thinking about her show wasn't something that she only did when she was at work. It was something that she was always working on that she was always, anytime we were, you know, driving, listening to the radio, she's like flipping through different uh, stations and listening to them and thinking about how they're programming it and what are they doing? What are they playing and reading magazines and thinking about like, how can I incorporate this into what I want to talk about? And you know, teaching me that like you can find inspiration and creativity literally everywhere and that it's something that you can make a part of your life in every facet. And um, and um, and so I got to see that and, you know, not a lot of people get to have that as an example in their home. And it was uh, uh, something that I didn't know until, you know, until recently. It's been something that I've been thinking about a lot that that I, I uh, as a kid, you take for granted. But now I see how much that was a huge part of uh, me being able to have the audacity as a first gen kid uh, to go after this. And so, um, yeah, and then, you know, on the, the second part of that is then after going to film school and being in the industry and, and working as a PA in reality for a while, meeting um, uh, Justin Simeon, who is the creator of Dear White People. And I got to meet him when he was, uh, we were at a digital, like a YouTube network, and him and Lena Waithe and some of the other producers on that project, like, um, being able to like just see how they were fostering community and 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 in a space that felt like oh every other space feels so alien to me and I, I feel so like I don't belong and to be around them and to see including to be honest at that time like I think the community that we built as Latinx is in Hollywood is something that is 
is a little more new because I, you know I would try to find those spaces and I didn't feel like I quite belonged in those spaces. Um, and it was so I always talk about like you know the first filmmakers that really showed up and mentored me were black filmmakers and showed me what that looked like what community could look like and how you are like yo I'm reaching back and I'm helping you up with me and and you know even with me at the time being very rough around the edges um, and having to learn quite a lot on the job like we're able to still hold that space for me and let me stumble through it whereas anywhere in, in other spaces and you know when you know, I say other spaces I think we all are on the same page the the, the white spaces and the that <laughs> that it might I might not have gotten those opportunities to keep growing and to keep learning um so yeah that's that's like kind of the twofold answer of that of how where I found that sanctuary where I found uh my creativity and my being able to hone my craft and then for me um this is like part of my origin story. Like I'm always gonna say this, but um, I took a Ch Chicano studies film class in college. I went to UC Davis, which is not a film school at all. Uh, but I, I watched Aurora Guerrero's Mosquita y Mari and that was like the only narrative um, like piece we had. And then I saw that she was like a Chicana director and I kind of didn't know that those existed before or like, I guess I didn't know I can do that before, right? So then after watching that is kind of how I got inspired to go into film and all of that. And um, I got to actually tell her that she inspired me on the set of Hentified. <laughs> so it was like really nice to be able to do that. Um, and um, I think another thing I realized in my journey, like here still currently like in this um, industry is that I've been able to be in a sanctuary space or like a safe space throughout my career, which I think is rare, but I hope is more common now because I got to intern at Macro, which is like a PLC, you know, production company, which led to We Are Me Too, which is a Latinx digital media company, which led me to these two people, <laughs> uh, which is, a, you know, I got to work on a Latinx show and got to return for season two. And I'm currently working at Con Todo. So I just feel like I've been able to kind of make those connections. And I think it's like, I think that's just going to keep growing as Marvin was saying, like, like Latinx Hollywood didn't exist, but it's like getting bigger. Um, so I'm kind of like in that space right now. I think I came in in that sweet spot where like it's just growing and growing and I'm able to be part of that journey with it. So yeah, so I think a sanctuary space is growing for, for us here. Doris, how about you? Well, for me, um, I mean, I wanted to add to that the reason why all these people are here together because I saw that Marvin and Linda were intentionally creating safe space for not only the art that they're creating, but for the next generation of creators. And that's why Steph is here on this panel. So thank you both for treating my amiga with so much love and tenderness and respect and empowering her um, to continue doing that. Because I think the reason why I'm here today is because people pass the torch to me. Um, I always think of this like jar method of like, how difficult it is to like try to open a jar and you're like banging the hell out of it and using the cuchillo to try to like make the dents on it and then you pass it over to your friend and it's like so easy for them um and that's because you did all that banging and I think that um I think there were people that came before me in the industry that allowed me to then just like open the jar once like there was like this explosion of like Latinx indie I, I grew up really loving alternative music but never really finding myself rep represented in it um and then I found a kid like Kuko in, in a backyard show in commerce where Stefo was actually there too February 17th February 19th of 2017 we were like the oldest people there and we didn't even know that we were both there we didn't meet until months later when we did a project for me through with Kuko um, and I just saw myself and like the hundreds of kids that poured into this backyard. I'm like, I would have been that fangirl that would have waited after in line to get my little picture with Buko. And um, just because I was that kind of a fan. And so I found sanctuary and shows. Um, and then when I saw this new generation of artists coming up, I found sanctuary in them. I'm like, I wanted to grow up to be like a teacher and like mentor this next generation of kids. Um, so that way they didn't feel so alone in their process of like, coming into themselves and then I found that like the million of Kukos fans ended up being my students I'm like yes share that article about representation in the music industry like like yes talk about the intersect of music and film and tv and and how you know like Lucas Yento was on like the last episode of of Hentified season one that was such a full circle moment and so um, yeah, I, for me, I, I found myself trying to find a safe space until, um, or trying to like fight for like a seat at the table until I had to realize I'm like, okay, I have to build 
a table for for me and my friends to like eat and and feel safe with each other and convivir and clink clink you know (laughs) so um now we're in a space where we get to create these like lanes that we get to run through and and program things like these and and institutions that historically have not given us the seats at the table now we get to pull up the way that we're pulling up tonight. So I'm very grateful for for the sanctuary that we get to create in community and I hope that it continues this way. Wow, yes to all of that, to making our table, bringing our half bang jars for our pals to open up for us. I mean, it's all like, we're there, we're doing it, we're living it. Um, And I really wanna dig into this a little deeper, Doris, around like the mentorship piece, right? Sanctuary is also the mentors who are are providing us that safe space. Um, and I know both for Steph working as a showrunner's assistant, but also you, Doris, now mentoring the next generation of folks through your mentorship program, I would love to know just like how has, uh, you know, how has mentorship shaped your understanding of, of Sanctuary and your experience? Well, I always wanted to be a teacher. So I think this is like fulfilling that like larger highest purpose that I know that I, I have on, on this planet where um, especially having the experience of feeling like solita at the show and or like being only brown girl like in the room and stuff. And the first day that we launched our mentorship um, program, which was last month, 100 kids showed up on the first day. Quería llorar, dude. I'm like, all you guys are interested in getting into the music industry like that. That blows my mind because I was like the only Latina in the room all the time in my internships or um, felt like I couldn't really find anyone who had a very similar experience growing up that also wanted to like enter into this space and so me siento como like encargada like I feel like really like I have a duty to fulfill that like this doesn't end here you know we saw like the rise of like the bedroom pop era and how like folks like Cuco and Omar Paulo and Interwave really like created this like Trojan horse for then like this whole new um, generation of artists to like make their way like Luna Luna and Cat Suoso and Loyal Lobos and um, Tablito, like we're seeing everyone pour through in these editorial playlists and such, but now there's this new generation of kids that want to learn how to push this art and there's a surplus of artists but not a surplus of folks in the industry to actually push that art or have like the know-how how to navigate that and I didn't necessarily come from a very specific music industry program I I went to Cal State Fullerton and and I commuted from Orange County to LA uh, four times a week for free <laughs> to, to work for free and just to, to learn just because I wanted to do this and so I I just felt like um, I needed to be a part of that uh, uh, of trying to usher this new this new gen and so now that we're really starting to reopen things like I met some of my best friends through shows or panels and such that I would attend and we created community together and we're like all right let's look to our left and right like let's link arms we're about to like like rush this this industry together and now with this pandemic they didn't necessarily have that opportunity to do that so any way that I can be a part of facilitating that that's just like del corazón, you know, like I, I got to see my dreams come true and I want to see the whole whole lot of other people's dreams come true because it doesn't stop here. And then for me as a mentee, because um, Marvin and Linda are my mentors, I, get, I feel very taken care of in this industry. And I feel like a lot of people don't have that. Um, like I think uh, when I was uh, going to UCLA for like a class, they're like, yeah, you're going to have to um, be an assistant at a talent agency and they're going to treat you like shit and you're going to have to do this and this and that and get paid like pennies. And I was like, uh, no, like I just I was like, I'm not doing that. I, there's another way, you know, like there has to be another way. And I did find it through being able to work at We Are Me Too. Uh, and that's where I met Marvin and Linda. And like our mentorship and like, I just, I love it. Cause like, I literally, like, I'm not, I'm not their assistant anymore, but I still feel like really taking care of them. And I feel like every win that I have, like, I, I just want to tell them cause like they have made me feel like that scene and they have made me feel that taken care of. Um, so yeah, like, it's just, it's just like, there's like no, like, like they want to see me win as much as I want to see them win, you know? So it's very reciprocated. So I feel like I've never felt that that what they explained to me like in that class I've never felt with them or anyone around me and people are always saying like it's not going to be like this forever but I'm like I keep finding moments where they are and they're going to continue to be like this and like have people that care about me around me so yeah it's been very nice and um 
Franz in this um, panel too, like here. And he's also feeling the same. Like, it's just like, like Marvin Linda really care about us winning and getting past this. And like, that makes me obviously like, want to help the next generation like Doris. And that's why I do little things here and there on my Instagram where I'm like, I just want to like show people and demystify this industry. Cause like, it's like, like you just have to learn certain things and you kind of, it's just people not sharing that information, right? So it's kind of just being able to bring our community with us. So yeah, super inspired by these two right here. Um, Cause I just love them so much. And they like saw my hustle from the beginning and they're like, that's why we're bringing you under our wing. Cause like, we know you want this, so yeah. Awesome stuff. The check is in the mail. So thank you so much for those words. Shut up. <laughs> Steph, Steph is our adult daughter. Um, we birthed her. her. We birthed her through Heather. came from our she, womb. You can't come over to do laundry anymore. You're abusing that privilege. <laughs> uh, I love it. I love it. Yeah, Steph, I think you're absolutely right in naming that your experience is probably really unique. And Marvin and Linda, I, you know, my sense is that you may not have shared that experience with Steph and that all of your career was in this safe space where folks understood you and wanted to nurture and mentor you. And so I'm curious, like, how did you navigate that when, if and when that was a case? And how was the transition to being on the, the other side of that where you could be the one to, you know, nurture the next generation? You know, what informed your, your approach there? Yeah, I mean, for me, I think it was a mix of like finding folks who were supportive and um, nurturing and, and then folks who weren't. <laughs> and I think also industry at the time, like Marvin mentioned, that wasn't fully, we didn't have a community in the industry that was fully baked, that was um, living in this, I think, time now where we're kind of leading from, from a place of love versus fear and violence and abuse. Uh, I think for, for us and for me, I'll speak for myself, but I know Marvin feels similarly, I think this industry historically has been a very violent one for a lot of folks in it. You know, you've seen so many things in, in articles, people coming out about the way that they've been treated in work environments in Hollywood. And I think that um, coming into it, I very quickly heard the same thing Stephanie did and, and found out that uh, this idea of working yourself to the bone and being treated poorly was just the standard, the status quo, which I don't think it's, it's not unique to our industry. Obviously, it's unique to our culture as a, a country, as a society that's rooted in white supremacy and capitalism. It's about like, let's let's knock people down. And I think the, the extra layer for BIPOC folks and other mar marginalized communities, it's, it's even more, right? I think for many of us, there's so much trauma in our lives that is like rooted generationally in these things. And for me personally, I've done a lot of self-development and, and gone to therapy for many, many years. I talk about this all the time. And from that learn the shaming and, and abuse, like this, these are not places to create from, these are not places to treat people from. And I have strived very hard to prove this narrative wrong that we all have to suffer in order to reach our dreams. Like that's not the reality. It's a narrative that follows a lot of us kids of immigrants because our parents are brought into a country where they're told you're only good enough to be here if you prove that you're worthy of being here. And so we're taught the same, that we have to kill ourselves to be worthy to be here. And I don't believe that. I don't think it's okay to be told that. I don't wanna tell the next generation that. I think we're here to heal that. And I think we're here to heal that in this industry so that folks like us can come up in it and change it and change representation in it. Because if you don't have an environment where retention is real, then how are you gonna have creators who can keep going and keep creating, right? Like we already have so much up against us, but add on top of that, let me re-traumatize you over and over again. It's like, nah, like I'm not here to traumatize anybody. I'm here to heal and to create a safe environment. And I mean, psychologically and, and, and physically, you cannot create from a place of fear. It's like scientifically proven. So why would I treat the people who work for me, the people that I mentor, with so much with shame and abuse when like I'm trying to get them to be their best selves like one that's just not me but two like I want to I want to foster people who are going to be able to come up and create the change we're looking for right and I, I think that that for me was so vital and important and with Steph I, I just and anybody who works for us like I try my best to be my best self you know I'm not perfect but I try my best to be my best self and do what's right for the the artists that are coming up and having an environment that is filled with love is part of that so I know it's a big it's a big mandate for me in my work and the ways that I build the environments that I create Marvin 
Yeah, I'm trying to go back to the, 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 what, the question, which is uh, what were some of the challenges, right? You know, off of what Linda was saying, it reminded me of like when you talk about that, that, that kind of model citizen mentality that our parents kind of passed down to us. Um, it, it made me think about, uh, I mean, you know, you know the story, but I, I talk a little bit about this, but I like, you know, the fact that like, I, after graduating, I mean, through graduating, I went to a for-profit college. And so when I left, I was, I definitely felt like I was like, oh, I'm at a disadvantage coming out of the school because I'm not coming from the USC's or the AFI's or like, you know, I'm over here competing with the kids that have those pedigrees. And so like, I have to bust my ass to be able to get an opportunity here and to be able to do this. And, um, and I, I remember like how long it took me to feel comfortable, like just taking a break. You know, like it took years of working and working and working nonstop to to get to that point. Um, and um, it is it is this like kind of cycle, this pattern that we do, like that we inherit and that we that, you know, yes, like it's a, it's a thing of gratitude that I give like to my my that I've inherited this work ethic. Uh, but um, it is something that like, you know, that took a long time for me to 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 what's the word? Uh, um, uh, unlearn. There was a, I was trying to find the fancier word um, for unlearn. There was another one, but um, it, it, so aside from that, I mean, I think that, and it's something that you don't know going into it when you don't have those, the, the theos and the theas that work in the industry or just in general to, to be able to look to, to like, hey, like what's normal, what's okay? How do I navigate this? Um, how do I make sure I don't uh, burn out and, and, and just like kill myself, you know, giving this everything, every like last drop of me, um, it, it, it can be so difficult. And so, which is why, you know, being able to build out, I think, uh, uh, this you know community the way that Linda and I are you know we're talking about how important this shit is to us it's you know one of the things that I think that you know like Steph and I'm sure Fran and people will will uh, uh, comment on that we say too often probably that you know maybe we uh, we use it too much but it's reminding people to be like hey can you like stop working like it's go go home like you're done go home please rest this weekend I don't want to see emails from you um, and just reminding people that I'm like it's work will be here on Monday, like chill out, like it's fine. Uh, Cause I think in this industry, like, you know we're all trained to just like kill ourselves to, to, to make it, to, you know to achieve that idea of making it. And, um, and, and I think for me, you know it, it's very true. Like Linda, what you're saying of, uh, uh, of what of not being able to create from a place of fear of not being able to create from a place of um, of, of, of shame or just uh, 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 anxiety, especially, um, you know, like Hentify didn't happen until I started dating this girl and was like taking breaks for the first time and going and taking naps in the park and going to museums and going to, you know, uh, 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 como se llama este? I'm blanking on the name right now, La Plaza, and, and seeing that museum and being like, yo, there's a lot that I want to know more about, about my history, more I want to know about LA, and more that I want to explore here in these stories and uh, and unpack this side of me and my identity and my culture in a way that, um, with love, and not just because I was trying to pump out a viral content, you know? So, um, I don't know, it's very true. And so I think I talk, I, I, I definitely advocate for that idea of, um, the challenges sometimes are in a lot of at, one of the biggest challenges can be just yourself and like being your own like you know terrible boss uh because that motherfucker will be there 24 7 so um <laughs> you know and i think that that's something that we have to do a lot of work to um unlearn i still didn't find it i still didn't find the vet the, the fence here word. i still didn't find it but you know maybe i'll think about it and i'll come back to you fran said the program it, like un something about conditioning there's Uncon a condi around condition. conditioning I was going to say conditioning decondition decondition yeah. is that a word okay great I don't know let's say it is we're writers we made it up no, writers exactly <laughs> <laughs> I love it such salient points you're bringing to this discussion thank you so much and so I mean just to recap briefly we've now talked about sanctuary as points of access and entry as safe spaces to make creative work as mentorship um but you know in the spirit of a dynamic conversation, I'd love to introduce the idea of sanctuary 
as also a space for generative conflict, for difficult conversations to occur that move our communities forward. Um, and in fact, we had a question from the audience that addressed my inspiration for this question, which was actually the episode that my class watched, The Mural, um, which is sort of riddled with this, uh, this, this community conflict. And so the question from the audience member, Vicente, is I'm super curious about the fifth episode, The Mural. Was this episode inspired by the Por Vida mural by Paul back in 2015 up in the mission? I love the framing of the episode conflict as a riddle. Can y'all speak a bit more to the writing process of this episode? Yeah, I mean, the episode start was actually first um, conceived for the digital series. It actually existed in the digital series, a slice of that particular storyline. Um, so it went all the way back to then. And I remember Marvin and I at the time really wanting to write about an artist or a muralist in the community because the community of Boyle Heights, obviously there are so many artists and we wanted one of our characters to be representative of that. Um, and I think when we were trying to figure out what we wanted to explore with that particular storyline, um, we started to do research. And I think the inspiration actually came from an article, right, Marvin, that we read in New yeah. York. Yeah, I was about to jump in with that. I was saying like it was actually inspired. The original like inspiration was an article we read about. It was a white artist doing some sort of mural in Brooklyn or or, or you know like a, a predominantly PLC neighborhood, and but it was like yarn, like she did some sort of yarn thing, and and it was just like this point of contention, and you know, uh, and, and one of the things that you know caught our attention was the you know that the landlord had hired her to do it, and so we took use that as like a springboard and you know for us especially you know the whole show really revolves around especially when it comes to gentrification we're so used to seeing gentrification depicted as a uh, a white and black or white and brown issue and we really you know took a lot of uh, for us it was always so important to explore class within uh, and privilege within you know just latinidad and, and in our own neighborhoods and in our, our just uh, uh, generational kind of differences so I mean but that was yeah to answer it back to you Linda <laughs> <laughs> back to you Linda <laughs> and you thank her well I think the other piece of inspiration came from actually a good friend of mine um, who mm. I adore Adelina Anthony who is a, a artist in her own right and a filmmaker a queer Chicana um, powerhouse who uh, I came up with in this my Sanford days I remember talking to, I don't know how the conversation came up but she brought up um, and I, I really wish I had the artist's name um, written down so I could say her name right now, but there was an artist friend of hers, a queer artist who, um, you know, would do murals. And one of the, the things she told me was like, you know, um, our murals are defaced, like constantly, like they're always, like the minute it goes up, it's defaced. It's, uh, it's the, the, and then she talked about like, those are, for my friend who's a muralist, that's her baby. That's her like creative like child, which like I understand. I know Marvin does with the creation of a show. It's like, that's your baby. Um, and so like the defacing of art and having to like re come back and fix it up again and, and like like create it, like recreate it, like how the the resilience that that takes and then the, the suffering that comes with it, right? Because you're trying to create in your own community and your own community is rejecting you. Um, and we, because the show as a whole, we came into it thematically, like thinking about like, where do we all live in terms of the, the intersections of our lives? Like sometimes we fit into our world and sometimes we don't like metaphysically, we're always on, on living on a border where whether we're on the border or not, we're always between these worlds and they're always intersecting inside of us and we're never finding where we belong. So that was always driving every storyline that we were creating. And so when we were thinking about Anna and her storyline, we were thinking about artists, we we're thinking about our own experience. We poured a lot of our experience into the, into the TV series version of it, which was like this idea of like, how do you do your art? How do you pursue the quote unquote American dream of, of fulfilling that, that dream and not basically fuck over your community? Because like, I think for many of us artists, like we create and we're excited. And at some point we got to pay the bills. And at some point we got to put food on the table. And at some point we're like, I kind of want a new car. My, my bucket's been around for 16 years. I'm not talking about my own car, but Steph and Marvin know. Um, so, you know, like at some point you want to make some money. And, and at that point, how does that wealth, how does that upward mobility start to pull you away from your own community, especially if you're working class, low income, if you grew up with folks like, you know, you start to feel that distance and we wanted to explore what we ourselves were experiencing. And anytime we were at odds with the show and ourselves, Marvel would be like, put in the show, <laughs> put in the show. And that's what we would do. So I think for Anna's storyline, we really wanted to show 
kind of that struggle that we all go through with our own communities because you can't you're damned if you do you're damned if you don't and at some point you have to accept that and lead from your own heart and lead for lead from a place of like what's what what is like what is not only my joy but what is my gut telling me is right and and I have to follow that path so I think that's what really inspired that episode and inspired Anna's not only Anna's journey in the episode but in the series she really represents a lot of that in both seasons <laughs> oh yes yeah, season two we can't wait um yeah wow so there's so much there to just sit with that I, I know right all living through yeah <laughs> just like need a, I need a drink after that Linda <laughs> um so uh, I think the remainder of the audience questions can be uh, summarized into one brief one that I'll pose to the whole group that we can use to close, which is what advice do you have for artists who are fighting to find and create sanctuary for black and brown queer art? I was gonna say, Linda always has the, the, the good answer. I was looking at Doris and stuff like, what are y'all gonna say? No? I'm no, thinking, no I'm thinking. You're you thinking, okay. What was what was the question? What advice? Yeah, what advice do you have for artists who are fighting to find or create sanctuary for black and brown queer art? Um, I would say create sanctuary within yourself first and foremost. Like, like whenever I get this question, the first thing I say is like, whatever that self-development is for you, like do it. For me, it's therapy. I always recommend therapy. Steph is laughing because she knows. <laughs> you're getting... I'm in therapy because of her, so yeah. <laughs> Um, cause here's the thing and here's, here are the three reasons why, um, I have my little spiel. One, um, as an artist, you are, we are the translators of the human experience. We've been called here to do that. Like I know artists, y'all are up in your feelings all the time. I love you. I'm the same way. We're in our feelings because our gift is to feel like our gift is to translate the human experience. And to understand that experience, we have to understand the human psyche. And I feel like when you're in therapy, when you're creating a relationship with yourself, you're understanding, this understanding how we function as humans. Um, so that's one, as an artist, it really helps your, your way of creating. Two, like as an artist, you have to know your vision. You have to know who you are and you have to find your voice. How are you gonna find your voice if you don't have a relationship with yourself? If you don't understand who you are and where you're coming from, if you don't unpack the, op unpack the obstacles and the challenges, that are keeping you from your truest, most authentic self, right? Because once you get to that place, you get to the third thing, which is a place of empowerment so that you can walk into any space from that place and not get knocked down all the time. So that when people come up and try to tell you you're something you're not, you can very like powerfully say, no, I know who I am. This is who I am and I'm gonna move forward. And I think all those things really prepare you for not only environment like Hollywood, where like you're gonna get this left and right people trying to knock you down and tell you that your truth is not true, um, but any any environment that you're in, I think that the, whether it's your family, who some are sometimes very beloved, but they might also in their own sadly low self esteem or their own issues that they may have may try to knock you down in the process. Whether it's friends, whether it's an institution, a boss you have to find that fortitude within yourself. You have to create that sanctuary within yourself so that you can take it with you anywhere that you go. Um, so that's, that's, I could tell you about how to write all day, but listen, if you ain't got it inside of yourself to love yourself, you're gonna roll, curl up into a ball <laughs> like I did for many years and not write a word. So like the thing is, it's never ever writer's blog. It's never ever you're not good enough. It's never ever you can't write. You're a fucking talented bitch. You know, you can do this. Like you can, what is, re what is keeping you from that um, is what, what I feel like that's why I give that advice because I feel like that's really going to change your life if you can. Um, so yeah, that's, that's that. <laughs> um, um, what advice, if you want to create sanctuary, I, if you want to create, I mean like another on the flip side of the sanctuary for yourself, um, I guess I'll, I'll tell a little bit about like kind of just where I started and, and just to give some context to this. Um, when I got out of film school, well, when I was in film school, my last short was like uh, my, my thesis film, which is the, the idea is that like your thesis film is going to like launch your career, is going to go to Sundance, it's going to like get you all these jobs and all these awards and get, get you recognition so that you can start a career. Um, and my, my thesis film was the first time I, I attempted a dramedy and it was just, it was crap. It was terrible. It didn't get into anything. It was fucking trash. And so I 
Um, I obsessive, I, I was a stand up nerd, like can't like comedy my whole life and, and always followed and loved listening to stand up comedians talk about their process, the creative process and how they, they get up on stage every night and they just work the material and they work the material and they do it over and over and over every night. And so I kind of just applied that logic to directing and to creating. And at first the intention was like, I'm gonna make another short and that one's gonna be the one. I'm gonna, and now it turned out bad. I'm gonna make another short and that one's gonna be the one. I'm gonna make another one and like, and I shot every weekend for like the first year after I graduated. And in that process of shooting over and over again, I fell in love with the process. And eventually, you know, and there's still that hunger of like, hi, this, is, this has to get me to the next level and this has to get me to the next level. But to shoot every weekend, there's no money. Like I, it's, we're in the age of digital. I was shooting with like 50 bucks or I was shooting with my roommate and a couch I found in the alley, like whatever. I was just whipping up shit uh, every weekend. And, but in that process, I fell in love with just the making and to be able to get to a place where, oh, I've won because I'm just creating, I'm just doing this because I love this and because I want to be the, doing this. And this is my happy place. And this is my sanctuary is being on set is, is being playing with the camera. And if I'm not shooting a short or a film, I have my camera and I'm shooting photos. Um, you know, you know, like writers need to be writing every day. Like I basically getting to that place of just like, whether I'm getting paid or not, I'm doing this because this is what my calling is. And this is what I love to do. And this is how I, a way that I can express myself in a way that I process and a way that I get, I can interpret what the hell I'm experiencing, what I am learning and what I am dealing with in life. Like uh, um, either as a release or as a way to cope, like or as a way to learn something new about yourself that you don't even know you're doing because you're just creating from the heart like and being able to make it automatic and make it like second nature that I think um, when you're doing that and when you stop creating out of desperation or stop creating out of like I need to get to the next thing or I need to you know need this thing to be the thing like and you're doing it for yourself like the attention that it starts to bring in is 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 another thing, and especially, and I mean, this applies to filmmaking specifically for sure, because I that's my industry, but I'm sure it can apply in some way outside of that. But like when you're the one that's constantly making while everybody else is talking about it and talking about when they when they have what they need, when they have this and when they have that, but you're already doing it, you're already like while you were waiting, I made three more things, like people are just they're gonna they're like that train's moving let me go let me hop on that one you know people start to slowly show up and they will start to come in like i'll give you 50 but i'll give you 100 but i'll give you five grand for that like you know can you do this can you do that and it just builds um that's what my experience was and um i think was something that was possible for sure in a time and place because of when i started in the youtube boom in the digital space but there was no barrier there was no access to entry like or barrier to entry because anybody can upload, anybody can create. And I think that's what you see with influencers. And there's all these influencers out there that are banging out things and they're not very good. So like, you might as well also be keeping up like by creating some shit that like means something. So um, I don't know, that's my pitch. Uh, I hope that is helpful in some way uh, to y'all out there. This was indeed a pitch session. Good job. <laughs> right, thank you so you much. You got it, you got it. <laughs> You got the um, gig. Me, what was the question again? Just so I can. Uh, essentially, like, what advice do you have for artists who are starting or fighting to create sanctuary out in the field? Okay, I have an answer now. Um, Marvin and Linda make fun of me because they're like, you know, everybody. And I'm like, I do because I make community with these people. Like, we mutually, you know, like Doris, like, I met through We Are Me Too. Like, it's just like we and then we stayed in touch and we're friends now and like you know there's just a lot of like we like just exchange creative like ideas and everything so I think that's very important and supporting your friends too like I see a lot of people who are just like shooting different things or like doing different videos photographers Ruth my friend like it's just like and I just see their come up and it's like we're both mutually coming up but we've always been there for each other helping each other out and whatever we need. Um, and sometimes people take no money or sometimes people take half their rate or something, but like every short that I've made has come from like community um, uh, for Dreamer, my friend Delilah, she produced uh, she produced Dreamer and I met her at Hentified 
uh, cause she was an office PA. So it's just like being able to find those people that want to create with you and then making that happen. And I think making that happen is like very important. Like Marvin is saying, like, you can't, you can't just keep talking the talk. Like you actually have to practice and be okay that it's not going to be perfect the first time. Right. Like you're going to get better eventually. And like, that's something I'm learning in therapy. Um, cause Linda <laughs> had me go, but you know, it's just like, I'm, Linda has read some of my scripts that are like uh, okay and then they've gotten better and then you know like so it's just like <laughs> I did not say uh, okay never no, no, did no, I me, ever say no, that me I, I was that there way. and I believe Steph so <laughs> that's exactly how I function oh I don't know Steph this is terrible no, but she hasn't said that but for me I'm like I read them back and I'm like oh my god Linda thank you for reading that because that was not it you know but like I keep sending stuff like they're open to send me for me sending them stuff so you know, so it's just like finding those people you want to work with, read your stuff, like keep writing, keep like doing anything you can to just keep creative, be, be creative. So, yeah. That's off, Grace. All of y'all are so powerful. I can't. I mean, literally, Linda dropped the mic on all of us. You said, y'all need to go to therapy yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> but in serio, I think like uh, Marvin and Linda's response, I think Marvin, you came from a space of like, you can't create out of like scarcity. Like that, that's, that's not going to be a fountain of opportunity for you. That's not going to be really as genuine as possible. Um, I think we lean into scarcity mindset when we're unhealthy and, and we don't really know ourselves. And so Linda's point right then and there for all of us who want to create sanctuary for our own art and for our community's art you literally need to heal and you need to prioritize your health and invest in your healing like no other or else that's not going to be the most genuine version of yourself that's that's pouring into your art as artists uh as curators as writers directors etc educators in this room we are conduits for whatever information that we receive whatever downloads that we receive and then we're able to displayed out on a program like this or in concerts or in classrooms or in premieres etc like we are blessed to be the conduits to connect to these kinds of um environments and these institutions that didn't necessarily house us before and so that's a that's an honor that's a responsibility and that first and foremost comes from making sure that we're investing in ourselves and that we're investing in, in our path and in our individual journey to make sure that we don't project and that we and that we don't um cast on to others that we can really like carry ourselves and heal ourselves um and then make sure that from there then we can look to our left and right build the teams that we need to and then come through the building like a trojan horse and say what's up this is our art we're ready to go y'all ready to cut the check or what and so <laughs> uh, from what i've seen it's, it's all been through community like stefo said i think people who say our names in rooms um speak well on our behalf when we're not around um, that the think of us when opportunity comes up um, and really then because of that that encourages us to keep creating and to keep um, making space for our communities are to thrive not just for our own I think that that's where we get to like alley-oop each other any opportunities that allow us to grow um, that creates sanctuary that creates safe space uh, for for anything that we create to thrive so very grateful for every single person in this room because each and every one of you like I feel like you guys have really like put that on your back to create sanctuary wherever you go not just for your own art but for the art of those that you see in front of you so that's beautiful to me and I think that's what then creates a larger movement of sanctuary within what we are doing so un beso un abrazo fuertísimo dude y'all are amazing I agree 100 yes to all of that Thank you, thank you all so much, not just for joining us tonight, but for being out there in the world, making space for folks like us to get out there, make art and build community. And, you know, we out here. Uh, yes, Doris, do you have any parting words as our brilliant curator for the evening? I just want to say thank you. I'm in so much gratitude for every single person that shared their time, their talent, their energy from the crew that produced what we made happen last week. Your girl got food poisoning and the ship didn't sink because there was a beautiful team that still made it happen. Um, to every single one of you who, who have trusted me to, enough to, to be a part of this conversation, I, I think this is like the, our mission is completed, you know, just to, to bring together this beautiful constellation 
and coalition of creatives that actually utilize their voice to leverage the needs of our community. So I'm just, keyword is gratitude. And to you, Hasmin, for, for really coming through and, and bringing this conversation together to the Visions and Voices folks who have given us the opportunity to even create a program like this, to the Annenberg Innovation Lab, to literally changing my life with this fellowship. It has allowed me to redirect and pivot and transform in ways that I would have never imagined. So, pues, yeah, bien agradecida. So thank you to every single person who has attended uh, today, who has promoted today, who has taken part in, in what we are creating in this movement. And, well, this isn't the last of it. So stay tuned with what we're doing. Yes, here, here. Thanks, all. And, yes, it looks like Laura Garcia summed it up perfectly. Okay, everyone, let's go to therapy and create. <laughs> 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 Thanks, everyone. Like to, Thank you all we so much. We need to have like a sponsorship from like a therapy website. Like yes. <laughs> Better <laughs> help by Linda Yvette Travis. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> I'm down. Call me up if you're on here. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. So happy to be Thank here. Follow, follow us Thank on the you. socials. Yes. Follow Thank you so much. Thank you. No, me hold mine, my personal one. Okay, bye, guys. <laughs> <laughs> bye, everyone. Bye. Have a good night. Thank you so much. Thank you.